questions and maybe have a little break before the next master class. Okay? So, uh, hi, it's very nice to be here. As Professor Gagnon said, my name is Ana Maria Otamendi. I am a professor of collaborative piano at Louisiana State University. I'm originally from Venezuela, I've been in the States for a long time. And uh, I've been very passionate about this topic for a good 10 years now. And it all started with some reading about habits and about how our brains work and about how we process information. And I started seeing there were a lot of contradictions, a lot of things that we assume about ourselves that are not true at all and that actually sabotage the way we learn and the way we practice our instruments. So the more I read, the more I became fascinated with it. And this eventually turned into a class that I teach at LSU for graduate students for all instruments and voices. Uh, that is called learning effectively. So what you're going to see today is a very short, condensed version of that whole semester class that I teach at LSU. So, I wanted to start here. Why? We see these people and we think that we here are very different from them, right? These are cave people. And um, let's say that their lives are very different from ours, right? Their goals back then were finding food, and then not becoming food, and having children and preventing your children from dying. That was kind of your goal for your whole existence, right? And the way that these people learn was very different from the way we learn now, right? They learn by watching other people in their tribe and seeing what they do, learning from their parents, learning from experience. Like if it was a plant that somebody ate and died, then you'd be like, I will not eat that plant because then I will die as well, right? You learn by experience, by smelling things and trying things and listening to things and, and looking at things. And that's what our brains like. Nowadays, how do you all learn? You say, well, I have a test. Here's a chapter. Read the chapter. You have a test in two weeks. And that's not the kind of thing that your brain is very excited about. So the other reason why I'm starting here is because although we look very far removed from these guys, our brains haven't changed that much. Uh, Homo sapiens became a species about 200,000 years ago and the brain was very similar to the brain that we all have in this room. There was only one small difference. There's a very thin layer of cells on the top that's called the neocortex. That's kind of the only physical difference between their brains and our brains. The other reason why I'm bringing this up is because when people are under, under stress, and this is like severe stress, right? Like I'm about to die stress. Uh, a lot of things happen physiologically, right? Your pupils dilate your blood starts pumping a lot faster, right? So then it starts sending blood to your muscles so you can get ready to fight or to flight. You all have heard about the fight or flight response. You probably have read about that or heard about that somewhere, right? So, uh, and then most importantly, that layer of cells called the neocortex, which is where you guys think, where you make your rational choices, that layer of cells gets blocked. Why? Because your brain doesn't want you to get distracted. Your brain wants you to focus on the threat so then you can analyze, what am I going to do, right? Am I going to run? Am I going to fight this thing? So why am I mentioning this? Because when you guys are under stress, and hopefully your lives are not as stressful as this, right? Stress could be, I have a test tomorrow, I have not studied for this test, right? I have a lesson tomorrow, I have not practiced for my lesson tomorrow. I have a recital in a couple weeks, I do not feel ready for this recital. That's stress as well. And you react on the same way that this guy reacted when the lion, or the mountain cat, or whatever that is, is a saber, I guess it's a saber tooth tiger, was uh, chasing him. So the reason I'm mentioning that is because if you're aware that when you're under stress, you stop thinking, you quite literally stop thinking. And that's probably the opposite of what you should be doing, right? You should just actually calm yourself down and think, what should I be doing right now so I can prepare for my lesson, or my test, or my recital? And I'm going to be bringing this up throughout the lecture several times, okay? So, um, the lecture is going to be divided into two parts. The first part, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about the brain. I'm going to tell you a little bit about neurology and psychology. And then the second part of the lecture is going to be how do we apply that knowledge into practicing your instrument or learning anything, okay? And then I'm going to be asking you guys questions throughout the lecture. Uh, it's kind of more than questions, are, I'm going to be polling you guys, okay? So, how does our brain work? We have about 100 billion neurons, okay, up here. And there, each one of these neurons is connected to thousands of other neurons. So, in terms of space, if you know anything about computers, uh, this is the equivalent of the amount of data that it would take to have 4 million TV shows with all their seasons included. So, if you think in terms of gigabytes, that's a lot. 
like a lot. And that's the average person, it's not a genius, okay? So what that means is in terms of capacity, we have the capacity of remembering every single thing that has ever happened to you from the moment you were born to today, in terms of capacity. I don't know about y'all, I cannot remember what I had for lunch a few days ago, okay? Let alone what happened to me 15 years ago, okay? And then we're gonna talk about why is that the case. But in terms of capacity, all of you guys have that capacity, okay? So, I want you to imagine that those neurons are like this. For some reason, my pointer doesn't wanna point into the screen, it points everywhere else, but not here. Uh, I want to imagine that neurons are like these little Christmas lights, okay? This is a very rudimentary sketch, but I'll give you the idea. So, every time that you remember something that happened to you, okay? Or every time that you remember a piece of information that you learn at some point. So let's say today, for the purposes of this presentation, I tell you, Brahms was born in 1833. And let's assume that nobody here knew when Brahms was born, right? So whenever you try to remember tomorrow when Brahms was born, the same neurons that light it right now, and I'm telling you, you have 100 billion of them, and there's a very specific number of neurons that light it on and off when I gave you that piece of information. So then when you think about that tomorrow, the exact same neurons, when you say, when was Brahms born? 1833? Those same neurons are gonna light on and off, okay? So why do I mention that? Because neurons and memories and knowledge is quite the same as muscles. So every time you think about that piece of information, the connection between the neurons that are associated with that memory are gonna get a little bit thicker. That connection is gonna get, so it's kind of like if you were working out, right? And your muscles are getting a little bit bigger. And then the thicker the connection, the faster you're gonna be able to remember that piece of information in the future. So quite likely every time you think about something that you learn or something that happened to you, that memory becomes stronger. And the less you think about it, it becomes weaker, okay? So basically a memory is a network of neurons that are firing together, on and off. Those things are called synapses, in case you're interested. Now, an interesting thing about your memory is that using it actually changes your memory. So if, if there's an accident and there's a couple of eyewitnesses, the police is gonna keep the eyewitnesses separate because a lot of times the testimony of what one eyewitness can influence what the other person saw. And it's not like they're lying, it's quite simply that it'll affect the way they remember things. Also, it probably happens when you go to a family reunion, I'm sure everybody here in their family, there's stories about the crazy uncle or the silly cousin, and then the stories come up, like every time you get together for Thanksgiving. And the story's always a little bit different. And there's always a little bit of ornament, and the story gets usually bigger and more ridiculous every time that is told. And it's not because people do that, they're not trying to lie. It's your brain who's naturally doing that, ironically, to try to remember things better. So well, that could be a problem because then you remember things and you could swear this is what happened. This is not exactly what happened, okay? And again, I'm gonna be bringing up this information throughout the lecture. Now, I wanna talk about how our minds work. There's a really fascinating book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, and he's a psychologist. And he says that our brains have two different systems, system one and system two. So system one is kind of like this robot. It's fast and it's involuntary. For instance, it allows you guys to breathe without having to think about it. Breathing keeps you alive. You don't have to be constantly thinking, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, right? It's something that happens automatically in your body. So that's what your system one is. The thing that allows you to perform very difficult things like playing your instrument, so you don't have to think about what each of your fingers is doing at one point in time, or what your breath is doing. You learn how to do it, and you know, at some point you know how to play a scale, you don't have to think about each of your fingers as you're playing a scale, right? That's your system one. It means, it means knowledge that has become automatic. So system one is fast, is involuntary, is something that you normally cannot control. So it allows you, if I ask you guys how much is two plus two, you would say four. You don't have to think about it anymore. When you were a kid, you had to use your fingers, right? Now, if I ask you guys to finish the phrase, bread and, you don't have to think about it. It's automatic. Capital of France, hopefully, you'll say. Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. So that's your system one, okay? Now, system two is the opposite of system one. So system two is like Yoda, if there are any Star Wars fans here, okay? So Yoda is slow, but it's very knowledgeable. So system two is the one that makes you uh, take, it, it's, it's the one who allows you to make rational decisions, right? So, system two is expensive. Why? So, 
because we are coming from cavemen, your bodies are actually really well designed to save energy at all costs. Because cavemen didn't know when they were going to eat again. Right? Nowadays, hopefully you all know that you have a, a meal waiting for you. That was not the case for them. So they were said, we need to eat as much as we can and have some love handle reserves here because I don't know when my next meal is going to be. Right? So then the body became extremely good at saving energy. What does that mean? Every time you think, you're spending energy. Because thinking takes glucose that comes from your food. So then basically your brain has been designed to try to not think at all costs because it, it costs energy, right? And that is a problem if you're studying and it's a problem if you're practicing because you should be thinking, hopefully, when you're studying and when you're practicing. So basically you're kind of going against our nature, which I, I think is really actually liberating because then you start realizing a lot of things about why we do the things we do. And it's not because we're lazy or because we're glut gluttons, it's because we've been designed to be that way, okay? So system two is the one that allows you to, let's say, do some literature homework that is complicated and you're thinking about what you're writing. It's the one who al um, allows you to maintain a faster speed of walking. So a lot of times each one of you have a normal walking speed. Some people walk faster, some people walk slower. If you want to try to walk faster, you're going to have to think about it. And the moment you stop thinking about it, you'll go back to whatever your normal walking speed is. It's the one that allows you to make a difficult calculation. So I ask you guys, this is my first question of the day. Which one do you guys think is in charge most of the time? And I want everybody to lift either one finger for system one or two fingers for system two. Go. Okay, so it's kind of evenly split between one and two. Drum roll is system one, right? So, you know, most of us here think we're intelligent people, right? We are either high school students, college students, college professors, right? We are in charge of our decisions. We know what we're doing. We're in charge of our lives. That is a lie, okay? You guys are slaves of your habits. If your habits are good, good for you. If they're not good, not so good for you. Okay, because most of the things that you do every single day are a product of habit. From the way you brush your teeth, from the way you talk to people, from what you eat, from how you sleep, all of that is a habit. Okay? So, that's, so you see there's already a disconnect. A lot of us identify with system two. System one normally works great. If you're walking down the street and a car is about to run you over and you do this, that's your system one. Keeps you alive. You didn't even think about it. You didn't even bat an eyelash, right? But Sometimes system one jumps to conclusions. This is what prejudice is, right? You look at somebody on the street that you have never met, and because of the way they look, you make, a, you make an assumption about that person. And you're probably wrong, because you don't have any information about this person, yet you're already thinking, oh, this person might be dangerous, this person might be a threat, this person might be whatever, right? That's your system one jumping to conclusions. As, as you see, we identify with system two, but the truth is that system one makes most of the decisions in our lives, and that's a problem. And a lot of times they, all, they fight over who's in charge. So if you're walking down the street and you see a big dog, and you were thinking of God knows what, and you see the dog just stop, right? So system one basically says, hey, system two, I need you. Then system two comes, and it's like, let's analyze the situation. Is this dog dangerous, right? Is the dog like burying their teeth? Is the tail like this or is the tail like that? How are the ears? And you see, is it going to attack me? No. Okay, great. The dog is not dangerous. You keep walking. System two goes away. That's kind of a very rough representation of what goes on, on our brains all the time. Okay, now related to system one and system two, there's two different modes of learning. Okay, the, dif the focus mode and the diffuse mode. So the focus mode is when you're actually trying to learn something. So, like if you're trying to learn a new piece of music, you're thinking of fingerings, you're thinking about how am I going to play this, where am I going to breathe, all that fun stuff, right? You're like actively trying to learn a piece of music. Then the diffuse mode is when you're not actively trying to learn something. And the interesting thing is our brains continue working on the stuff that you were trying to learn while you're in focus mode when you're not trying to learn something. So the diffuse mode is when your brain is not actively doing something specific. So it's when you're taking a bath, or taking a shower, when you're walking and you're not using your phone, when you're on the bus and you're not using your phone, when you're lying in bed and you're not using your phone, when you're basically just like daydreaming, okay? So uh, Isaac Newton, the great inventor, he said he had his best ideas. He had a chair, like an idea chair, and then he had a big plate, a metal plate on the side, and he would sit there with a ball in his hand and said, I would just sit there to try to take a nap, 
and I would grab the ball and put my arm on the armrest and as I was falling asleep my hand would do this and then the ball would fall and make a big noise and the plane would wake him up and he said that instant right before falling asleep is usually when he had his best ideas. Why? Because his brain wasn't actively working on something and maybe he was thinking of a problem and trying to figure it out and then in the moment he was like ah I got it. So that is super important and that's the time to be creative. Generally, like it happens to me, I go in a shower and I have this great idea. The, the challenge is usually to remember the idea by the time I get out of the shower. <laughs> so it's like those moments are super important for your brain to think, to learn, and to be creative, which we as musicians want to be creative, right? So uh, focus and diffuse mode are obviously related. So focus mode is related to system two and the diffuse mode is related to system one. There are two different modes of learning that are equally important. Basically, highly attentive state versus a resting state. So how does it help you learn? By consolidating knowledge while you're in the diffuse mode. So then your brain can continue processing the things that you were practicing when you were in the practice room. Now, the final stop of this first half is the two types of memory, okay? So I don't know how many of you guys have watched Finding Nemo. Uh, but uh, if you remember, Dory had a really hard time remembering anything that happened two seconds ago, right? So that's your working memory. Your working memory is the one that allows you to remember something that you just learned or a piece of information that is useful right now that you might not need later. So if I tell you guys my phone number is 734-277-7370, if you're trying to remember that, you're going to repeat it, right? Until you find your own phone so you can put the number in or, or find a piece of paper so you can write it down. The moment that you stop thinking about that, like five minutes later, you will not remember my phone number, all right? Unless you made an actual effort to learn, right? So that's your working memory. So a lot of um, research in psychology says that we have four slots for working memory. So imagine that if you had actual like little cubby holes in your forehead, that's the amount of spaces that we have available for uh, working memory. So what does that mean? If I tell you guys, so I, so I say, hey, can you go to the grocery store and get me bread and get me oranges and get me butter and lemons and get me a detergent and I also need some uh, cheese and then I need meat and I give you a list of like 10 things. On average, each one of you will remember about four things, right? But if she makes an effort, if they make an effort to say, well, she wanted some breakfast items, so we're going to classify bread, butter, and cheese as breakfast item. Then instead of three things, that becomes one slot. And then she says she wanted fruit, so she says she wanted oranges and lemons and apples. That becomes one item. So then that's a, th that's a process called chunking. And that's how we learn very complex information. So for you guys as musicians, if I play a minor scale, that's no longer eight unrelated notes. They become one thing. And then you're able to remember all eight notes as one thing because you know what a minor scale is. If you talk to a chess grandmaster and you show them the end of a chess match, they'll be able to tell you after like 10 seconds what happened in that match, move my boo, just by looking at it once. Because they're great at what they do, right? So that's what advanced knowledge can do, is help us do chunking to a much higher level. So then we're able to remember a lot of information in a short amount of time. So working memory, as I said, works through repetition. You repeat things and you're hoping that those things will stick, okay? Now the opposite of the working memory is long-term memory. So I want you to imagine that long-term memory is like a huge Amazon-style warehouse, okay? That warehouse is about 10 blocks by 10, and it has 10 floors, so it's huge, right? So now imagine that that warehouse contains everything that has ever happened to you from the moment you were born to today. Every single memory, every single fact that you have learned and forgotten is in there somewhere. Now the problem with this warehouse is, is it's completely dark. There's no light anywhere, okay? And I say, hey Clara, here's a tiny flashlight. Go find what happened to you on June 4th, 2003 at 4.02 p.m. Right, so if Clara's just going floor by floor with her tiny flashlight, Trying to see, say, where is this memory? Is she going to find it? I mean, what are the odds that she's going to find it? Maybe she'll be super lucky and she'll find it, but the odds are pretty small. However, if I say, hey, Clara, that memory can be found in floor four, and then you go to column number 2005, and then you go to row number three, bay number five. She's going to be able to find it, right? So that's what happens to your memories, okay? When you lose a pathway to a memory, you can no longer remember. That's why you guys cannot remember every single thing that has ever happened to you. However, 
I bet that at some point in your lives, maybe you were walking down the street and you smelled something. Let's say the same perfume that your grandmother wore. You just smelled it on somebody. And then all of a sudden, you remember something that happened with your grandmother when you were eight. You were in her kitchen and she made this cake for you or whatever. Or you smelled a specific type of food, something. Has that happened to you guys? So smell is a very powerful memory uh, associator, right? So that's what happened. That smell created a pathway so you could find that memory that had been quote unquote lost. So it's not that they're lost, it's just that you have lost your ability to reach them. Okay, so now we're gonna go to part two. So I'm gonna ask you another question, okay? I'm gonna read to you six learning strategies, okay? And then I'm gonna ask you guys three questions and I want everybody to participate, okay? So question number one. Which one of all of these do you guys think students use the most? Doesn't matter if it's high school, college, it's about the same, okay? So I'm gonna read to them and then you guys are gonna vote. Number one, rereading your notes from class. Number two, quizzing yourself after every chapter you read. Number three, making diagrams and drawings that connect different concepts or ideas. Number four, highlighting your books or notes. Number five, mixing different topics or pieces in the same study session. And number six, letting one or two days go by between sessions that deal with the same topic or piece. So now I want you guys to vote by raising a finger from one to six. Once again, one is your reading, two is quizzing, three is diagrams and drawings, four is highlighting, five is mixing different topics or pieces, and six, letting one or two days go by between sessions. Vote. Okay, I see some ones, some sixes, some ones, some sixes, some twos, some ones. Okay. So we have a pretty nice spread. Okay, great. So the answer is, and this is based on a lot of research, all of these answers I'm giving you are based on tons of scientific papers, okay? So the, the ones that students use the most by far are one and four. Rereading and highlighting, okay? Now here comes question number two. Which one do you think is, is the best of all of these? And this is again backed by ton of science tons of scientific research, okay? Go ahead and vote. Three, six, three, six, 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 three, five, okay, again, we have a nice, nice spread, okay? So, the right answer, and again, this is improved time and time again, and this has been, they have pitted one against the other, etc. in different studies. The answer is number two. And most of the time people are like, what? Like rarely somebody will get this right when I'm giving, and I've given this lecture many times. Rarely people will get it right. Two, and I'm gonna talk about why in a second, okay? Then after two, five and six. Those three are the winners, okay? But two is like up here, okay? Now the last question, which ones do you think are the worst? But, yes, I see a lot of ones. Yes, one and four. You see where the problem is? Right? You see the disconnect? So there are students that can be very responsive. It's like, I'm studying so hard and I'm getting terrible grades. I'm practicing so much, yet I cannot play this piece. Yet I'm not ready for my recital. So the student is frustrated and the teacher is frustrated. And this is why. Okay? So now I'm going to talk to you about two, five, and six and why are they so useful and how can we apply that to your practice today. So, there were two doctors, Dr. Bjork, they were married, who work at UCLA, they're psychologists, and they were obsessed with memory and learning. So they studied how people learned and what is it that would make a memory stick, which is really what learning is, right? Learning is you, you see a piece of information and then you put it in your long-term memory so then you can access it anytime you need it. That's what learning means, right? So they discovered that memories have two qualities, storage strength and retrieval strength. So I just told you guys that storage is not a problem, right? I told you that all of you have the capability here to remember everything. So storage is not an issue. The problem is retrieval, right? So they discovered that retrieving an item from memory has a huge effect on its retrieval strength. What does that mean? So if I ask you guys now, when was Browns born, right? And let's say that, let's say you don't remember, you're like thinking, right? It's like, okay. Sometime in the 19th century, it was 18 something. And then I think there was a digit in there that was repeated. So I think it was 1844 or 
1855 or 1833. Like you're really thinking and you're making an effort before you check your phone, right? And then you're like, okay, I think it's 1844. And then you check your phone, right? Oh, I was close, it was 1833. But the act of you doing that will make it twice more likely that tomorrow you'll remember when he was actually born than if you just looked it up, which is what most of us do. I'm terrible at directions, right? I'm horrible sense of orientation. So then I have to look at an address every time, and I've been there many times, and I still have to look it up because I never actually make an effort to remember how to get there. Some people are great about that, I am not. So, um, that's what they discover, and that's important. That's why quizzing yourself is such a great learning strategy, because just the act of trying to remember something, and then seeing if you actually get it right, will make it way more likely that you remember it tomorrow. It's just we don't do that because it feels uncomfortable. So the harder it is to remember something now, the more you'll remember it in the future, which is kind of ironic and kind of counterintuitive. Okay, so a lot of times students are very bad judges. Oh, I shouldn't say students. All of us are really bad judges of when we're learning well. That's why strategies that feel good, like rereading and mass practice, they feel good, right? Because you're rereading your notes and you're like, oh yeah, I remember when the teacher said that in class. And then you read again and it feels even more familiar. So it's like, oh yeah, I'm totally learning. This is great. And then the test comes and you like bomb it because you missed all the details, right? You thought you knew, but you didn't know. And while you were studying, it felt good. So that's what we're reading. And mass practice, what does mass practice mean? You just sit down on the piano and you play the same thing over and over again. And you're not really thinking about what's working, what's not working, you just play. That feels good because you're not thinking. Again, your brain is designed to be lazy. It's what the scientists call monkey brain. It's just what it is for all of us, okay? Uh, so that's what creates a fluency illusion or illusion of competence. You think you know, but do you really? And then wanting to learn something and spending time with it does not guarantee that you'll learn it. So all of these strategies of rereading and highlighting, you will learn something. It's just not efficient. You're basically kind of wasting your time. Do you know what you don't know? Of course, that's also why you have teachers, right? So they can tell you, these are the things you're doing well, these are the things that you could do better. And then finally, learning styles are a myth. So before you all get up in arms, yes, everybody has a tendency, like some people are more visual, some people are more oral, I get it, yes. What I'm trying to say is that the more learning styles you have, the faster and the better you'll learn, even if some of them feel difficult. Okay, so when I get to this point of the lecture, I tell people, if you remember one thing, from all of the information I had given you. If you remember one thing, I want you to remember this. Okay, so pay attention. Okay, so this guy, Ebbinghaus, Dr. Ebbinghaus, was another guy who was obsessed with memory. And he wanted to know how long would it take for the average adult to forget something. So he did all these experiments. I'm not gonna tell you what the experiments were about. But I'm gonna explain the results. Okay, so he reached what he called the forgetting curve, which is this red curve here. Okay, so up here is the strength of a memory from zero to 100, and up here we have days that have passed since the day that you learned something, okay? So for the purposes of this presentation, let's say that this memory is a poem, okay? So I gave you a poem by Lord Byron, and I say, hey, memorize this poem, right? And let's say that it took you two hours, and then you came and you recited the poem, with every word, every punctuation sign, everything was perfect, right? So that means it's up here. And let's say that three weeks later, you, you don't even remember who wrote the poem or what the title is. That means your memory is here and zero. Does that make sense? Great. And this is the day that have passed since the day that you memorized it, okay? So he figured out that with this curve, what does it mean? Like tomorrow, you would have forgotten about half of the poem. And then the day after that, you've forgotten about two thirds. And then the day after that, you've forgotten about three quarters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as days go by, you forget the whole point, right? Now, here's the interesting part. Let's presume that tomorrow you come back to my office and I give you back the poem and I say, review it. And instead of taking you two hours, maybe it took you 30 minutes, okay? So then memory goes back to 100%, right? Because you just reviewed it and you say it back to me and it's perfect, right? Now, look what happens to the curve. Now, the next day, instead of having forgotten half, you only forgot about a third. And then the day after that, you forgot about half instead of about two thirds, etc. Right? Now, what happens is the day after that, you come back to my office and you review it again. Now, look what happens to the curve. And let's say that you keep doing that every single day. 
What is the curve going to look like after a couple of weeks of you doing that? It's going to look like that, right? And what does that mean in practical terms from you, for you and this form? That you'll remember it, that you will not forget it. So why is this important? Why am I telling you, if you remember one thing, remember this? Because what does most students do? You have a new piece, right? So it's like, okay, I have this 4A sonata that I'm going to learn, right? And then today I'm going to start with page one and two. And I work for three hours on pages one and two, and I feel so good about myself, right? And then tomorrow I'm going to do pages three and four. And I work three hours on pages three and four. And then after that I'm going to work on pages five and six. Three hours on pages five and six. And then you keep doing that until you finish reading the sonata. And then when did you go back to pages one and two? A week and a half later. What happened to pages one and two for you? Oh. Right? And then it feels like, well, but I, I spent three hours. Like, where did that go? Right? So instead of doing that, what I'm asking you to do is like, you need to review, especially when you're learning a piece of music for the first time. You need to review tomorrow what you did today. And then the day after that, you need to review it again. And the day after that, you need to review it again. And you need to do that basically every single day until that feels like it's in your fingers. Until you can sit down in the morning and you can play those pages and play them exactly the way you want to play them. That means you have learned. And that's not going to happen in a week or two. It depends on how difficult the piece is, of course. If the piece is not, not hard, you probably won't have to do that for very long. Okay? So it'll make a huge difference. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. Now, strategies five and six were the other two that we were going to discuss, right? Five is what is called interleaving. It's mixing different kinds of problems that require different strategies. So in the case of students, that means either problems, it means passages or pieces. So what does that mean? It's like today, you're going to practice for half an hour the hardest passages on your etude, right? Then you're going to take a break, and then you're going to practice maybe the hardest passages on your Mozart sonata, then you're going to take a break. Then you, maybe you go back to your etude, and then you can take a break. So that's what I mean in the same study session. It's like you're, you work a little bit on this, you take a break, you work a little bit of that. They could be passages of the same piece, they could be passages of the different pieces, right? And then what do you do tomorrow? You do it again. You review what you just did, okay? So uh, this prevents overlearning, which is keep practicing things that you already know, and you just keep playing them because it makes you feel good, right? Then getting rusty between sessions seems harder. What does that mean? So today you work 30 minutes on these hard passages, and then you don't review it until tomorrow. You're going to feel that some of it got lost between yesterday and today, than if you had kept working on this for like two hours straight. But on the long term, at the end of the week, that passage is going to be way better than if you just did it for like two hours and then never revisit it again. Okay? Then remember the principle of desirable difficulty. The harder it is, the harder it feels that you're learning today, if you're doing it correctly, the, be the better you're learning on the long term. And then finally, you prevent a common illusion and fluency, which is continue practicing something that you already know because it feels good versus the stuff that you don't know well or the passages that are harder to play. Then finally, number six was the distributed learning or spacing effect. What does that mean? Letting a day or two go by between reviewing the thing that you are working on. So as you see, all of these are connected, right? So that's what it is. It prevents cramming. It's the opposite of cramming. Instead of just studying the night before the test, you study 20 minutes every day before the test for a week. You're not working any harder. Why? So there's this wonderful, fascinating study they did with students at Princeton. They grab about 100 freshmen. They divide them into two groups. And they gave each group a poem, kind of like what I was saying before, right? And then they gave group A. They said, here, you have one hour on Monday. Come to the lab. You'll study the poem, and they will test you on Thursday. And then group B, they said, you're going to come to the lab for 20 minutes on Monday, 20 minutes on Tuesday, 20 minutes on Wednesday, and we're going to test you on Thursday. So they both worked for exactly an hour. No difference. The only difference was one of them was one hour in one chunk, the other one was 20 minutes in three chunks. Okay? Then they tested them on Thursday. The kids of group B, they remember more than twice what the kids on group A. So statistically, that's a gigantic difference. Gigantic. So what I'm telling you is you're not working any harder. You're working the exact, exact same amount of time. You'll get twice the results. So then you have more free time to hang out with your friends 
or more free time to learn more music or simply learn music faster and better and be much better prepared for the things that matter to you. Because I'm guessing all of you are here because you care about music, because you care about being a good musician, right? So why don't more people do it? One, they don't know. I think that's the biggest impediment. Most students are not aware of these things. Two, because it feels harder. Because thinking feels harder. Because planning what you're going to practice, it's a lot harder than just sitting. Especially when you're panicking, what do you do? You stop thinking and you're like, I must play something. I must play because I have this tomorrow. And you're not like, wait, 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 wait. What should you be practicing and how should you be practicing this, right? We all, you all like can uh, get feel like you've been there. I have been there, okay? That's what we all do when we're panicking. Now the criteria is how often should you review something so you can remember. And that's something that it depends on all of you guys. Like we are all different. So the, one of the things I love about this type of practicing is that it forces you to know yourself because we're all different. It forces you to know this is hard for me, this is not hard for me, this is something I can learn quickly, this is something that takes me longer. So basically, depending on how hard the passage is, how often do I need to be reviewing it? This works for any new material. You can learn languages, you can learn music, you can learn anything you want, and it's the same thing. And as I said, you can double the retrieval strikes. Okay, so I'm gonna give you one little tip of practicing that works really well. It's called the Pomodoro Technique. Why is it called Pomodoro? Pomodoro means tomato in Italian. And this was discovered by a scientist named Francesco Cirillo. And you probably don't remember this, but grandmas used to have, instead of fancy timers on the stove, they used to have little timers that looked like that, that looked like eggs or carrots or some sort of like kitchen of uh, food items. Uh, so what is the Pomodoro Technique? This guy basically wanted to know what is the longest period of time that a person can be focused doing something complicated, right? And he came up with 25 minutes after a lot of research. I have some bad news for you guys. Nowadays, because of devices, that number has dropped significantly. Because we are all used to being constantly stimulated by TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and Netflix and all these things, so our brains are like this all the time, like little squirrel from um, Ice Age. So that's a problem, but I have good news for you is that can be trained. Your cap capability of focus can be trained. How? By doing it. By starting conservatively 10 minutes, 15 minutes of true focus on something. And then that will grow and that will improve, okay? So, what does that mean? What does the Pomodoro Technique mean for you guys? It means, well, you're gonna set a timer for, let's say, 15 minutes. We're gonna start with 15 minutes, and you're gonna put your phones on airplane mode, put your tablets on airplane mode, your iPads, and then you're gonna say, well, I'm gonna practice in 15 minutes this passage here. And my goal is to go from quarter note equal 50 to quarter note equal 75, and play it perfectly with the right articulation, the right dynamics, the right notes, the right intonation, everything, okay? Put the timer on, go. What does that do? One, when your brain is under mild stress, you focus a lot better. Because like, okay, I have 15 minutes, I have to get this done in 15 minutes. Then all of a sudden your focus is like Phew! And you really get focused into what you're doing. So what does it do? First of all, it helps you focus. Two, it gives you a practical goal, which we'll talk about goals in a second. And then three, when the timer rings, you stop. And then you analyze, did I do what I said I was gonna do or not? Okay, so it really works. I learned this the hard way because I got injured when I was 21. Because I started practicing instead of three hours, I went to six or seven without any like. I just all of a sudden decided I wanted to practice a lot more. Stupid idea. Uh, so I got injured. And uh, yeah, I know. Uh, so, and then every time, you know, I went to physical therapy, did the whole shebang. And after every time I tried to go back to my normal amount of hours of practice, the pain will come back. And it was very frustrating. And finally, my partner at the time said, well, why don't you just take more breaks? And I was like, oh, that's stupid, <laughs> right? And he's like, well, just try it. I'm like, okay, fine. At that point, I was, I was willing to try anything, right? So I started doing that. I started practicing for 30 minutes, take a break. And it was very frustrating at the beginning. Because it's like, what could I possibly accomplish in 30 minutes? I know. And I started doing it, I had no choice. And I discovered that then I could practice for an average of four hours, so it made, meaning eight intervals of 30 minutes. It took me a lot longer. So it took me about six hours to practice four. But after a month, I go to a lesson, and my teacher is like, wow, you learned this really quickly, and it sounded great, what are you doing? 
So I told her, and she's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. It's like, well, how come nobody ever told me that? You know, if it makes so much sense. And then it's like I discovered I was learning so much better. I was learning a lot more music. I was playing a lot better, practicing less than I used to practice before. So I discovered it by accident, and that's how I practice nowadays. I practice in intervals of 30 minutes, and then I take a five minute break. So the other thing that this does is that when you take a break, you give your brain kind of a boost, right? It's a little fuel, your brain relaxes, and then you'll be able to focus so much better on the next break. So, uh, I wanted to tell you guys about this wonderful book. It's called Peak by Anders Ericsson. So Mr. Ericsson is a, was, he just passed away, a very famous psychologist. Have you guys heard about the 10,000 hour rule? Is that something that, what have you guys heard about? Yes? It's like if you do something 10,000 hours, like you completely master it. Right, that you become an expert. Okay, so that was popularized by a very famous writer called Mal Malcolm Gladwell, whom I love, but Mr. Gladwell quoted that wrong. So it's not 10,000 hours of doing something, it's 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, which is very different, because you can be 10,000 hours hacking away at the violin without knowing what you're doing, you will never be Joshua Bell, okay? It will never happen, okay? However, 10,000 hours of deliberate practice will lead you to become an expert. So this guy studied a bunch of very famous musicians and not so famous musicians, very famous golf players and not so famous golf players, tennis players, chess, chess players. So people that need to practice something for many hours to become great at what they do. And he was obsessed with finding out what made somebody a master versus somebody who's good but not a master versus somebody who's an amateur, okay? And he came up with this, okay? So I really recommend the book. It's not hard to read, it's very accessible. You can find it on Amazon for like 20 bucks. Um, and he's going to basically explain in much more detail what I'm about to summarize for you guys, okay? So the first thing is he talks about you can build your potential versus fulfilling it, okay? And I think that's important. Obviously, that doesn't apply to physical things. If I wanted to be in the uh, WNBA, I'm probably not, it's not going to happen for me, okay? I'm too short, right? Obviously, there's some physical limitations. Uh, but he talks about, in general, for these abilities, you can build your potential instead of fulfilling. I mean, the more you practice deliberately, the more your potential grows, okay? So what is deliberate practice? First, you must have goals. And this is the first step in which most students fail, because they don't know. So what, are, what do I mean by goals? I mean short-term goals, meaning this next Pomodoro, this next 30 minutes you're gonna do, what are you gonna accomplish, okay? And goals need to have three characteristics. They need to be specific, they need to be achievable, and they need to be measurable. So what does that mean? If you say, I'm gonna practice Mozart, that's not specific, it's not achievable because it's not specific and it's not measurable because it's not specific. Now, I'm gonna practice bars 50 to 58 of the first movement of my Mozart sonata that is the hardest passage in the whole movement, okay? That's specific. And then I'm gonna go from the metronome equal 62 to equal 72. And I'm gonna erase it in intervals of three beats because it's a really hard passage, okay? If you're a pianist, I'm gonna practice it hands separate first, and then I'm gonna put hands together. And then I'm gonna see if after the end of 30 minutes, I can play that passage at this tempo. So that's specific, that is achievable because it's a short enough passage and it's not a huge tempo difference, and it's measurable because at the end of the 30 minutes you can say, can I play it at 72 exactly the way I wanna play it or can I not, right? So that's a goal, that's a short term goal. Medium term goal means where do I want my repertoire to be at the end of the week? What are the movements that I'm gonna focus on this week? And what tempi approximately do I wanna have at the end of the week, right? And then long term goal means I wanna play this very difficult piece in six months. Like I've never attempted, I'm gonna to try to play Liszt sonata, right? And I have never attempted to play some, I played stuff that is hard but not that hard. And I wanna play this in my senior recital. So when do you need to start planning? Not two months before, not three months before, a year before. And then you're gonna ask your teacher, what is the hardest section of the sonata? That's where you're gonna to start today. So then in a year, you'll be able to play a beautiful rendition of the Liszt sonata. But that's a long-term goal and you're really thinking far ahead. Or if you're taking auditions, I'm auditioning for undergrad, I'm auditioning for grad school. When do you need to start preparing for those auditions, right? So those are goals. Then focus. You need to obviously be focused when you're practicing because if you're not, you're not really accomplishing anything, right? So your job is to discover what are the things that rob you from your focus, and that's different for everybody, right? Is it your phone dinging every two seconds? You know, they discovered that every time your phone rings, even if you don't look at the message, you just heard it buzz or ring, 
it takes you 20 minutes to go back to a state of actual concentration. So it means if your phone dings every 10 minutes, you're never actually focused, okay? So my recommendation is if you're serious about music, put the thing on airplane mode when you're practicing, okay? Your, your practice space should be sacred, should be a time for yourself. If you're serious about being a musician, your practice space is who you are as a musician. So don't let the phone tell you when you need to look at the phone. You should be in charge of when you want to look at the phone, not when it wants you to look at it, okay? So what else robs you from focus? Maybe it's your friends knocking on your door every two minutes to chat. So tell your friends, how about we take breaks together instead of like interrupting each other. Maybe it's because you're practicing and you're looking at the window so people are passing by and you're constantly distracted so they maybe turn away from the window. Maybe it's your mind constantly telling you you need to be doing this, you need to be doing this, you need to be doing this. this. So that happens to me. So what I do is I have a little notepad on my piano stand. So when I'm practicing, I think, oh, I have an email, so and so. I just write it down. So then I stop thinking about that and I say, I will deal with that on my break, not right now. So you need to discover what are the things that are taking. Maybe you're not sleeping enough. That's certainly going to rub you away from your foot. Maybe you're not eating enough or you didn't eat right before you practice, or you're hungry. So you're constantly thinking about what am I going to eat instead of thinking of what you're doing. So take it a second to figure out what are the things that are rubbing you from your focus when you practice. Then get out of your comfort zone. What does that mean? Always do something that is slightly harder than what you're doing right now. So that means maybe a piece that is a little bit more difficult in a specific area of your instrument that you're not used to. You ask your teacher. And then, hey, I would like to work on my double thirds on the piano, or I'd like to work on my intonation, a very high range of my instrument, whatever, you know? And then maybe you don't need to perform that piece, but you're studying it so you can become better at something that is hard for you. Maybe if you're a pianist and you're not great at French repertoire, then you tell your teacher to, give you, to do an all French recital, you know? So then you really work on how to play French music versus German music. Then very importantly, constant, constant feedback. Like most students wait until they get to their lesson so the teacher can give them feedback. And the truth is that the lesson is about 5% of the time you spend in front of your instrument. So constant feedback means constantly listening to the sounds that you're producing and constantly analyzing, is that what I want? Was that in tune? Was that the right rhythm? Was that the right dynamic? Was that the right articulation? What are you trying to accomplish? Was that good? Yes, great, move on. Was that not good? Stop, think. What was not good about it? And then how can I make it better? And then you're constantly doing this sort of loop in everything you play. And then when you have worked on something and it's like you did this and this and this and this and it's still not better, then you go to your lesson and then you tell your teacher, okay, I worked on this, I worked on this like this and this and this and this and it's still not working, can you please help me? And then your teacher will be delighted to help you. And then your lesson will be so much more useful than you just going in there and doing a bunch of stuff that you could have fixed on your own. Because then you're kind of wasting your time and your teacher's time. Now, another great way of having constant feedback is recording yourselves, which is something my students hate. So I make them do it. <laughs> they hate it. But then I tell them, well, yes, you hate it because you listen to it and you're like, oh my God, I sound like that? And I was like, yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. But you want me to listen to that. And then you want your audience to listen to that in your recital? Mm, there's a disconnect there, right? So how about you listen to it in small chunks? So the other thing is don't record yourself playing the entire piece when you don't know it. Just record eight bars of the stuff you're working on. And then analyze it coldly and objectively like a scientist. Don't be like, oh my god, I suck! I'm horrible! No, that's not going to take you anywhere, okay? It's just listen to it and be like, like a scientist. Scientists don't analyze, they don't, they don't judge data. They don't say, good data, bad data. No, it's just data, right? And then see, what is the data doing? And then what should I do in this experiment so it works? So you should be the same way. You listen to it and you're like, okay, that was out of tune, that was out of tune, I was rushing. Okay, let's see, why is it out of tune? Is it my breath, right? Is it, or if you're fingering, it's uneven. Okay, why is it uneven? Is it my finger? Is it my motions at the keyboard? What is it that I'm doing? Record a video. And you'll be like, okay, I'm playing like this. Well, obviously it's not gonna work, right? Okay, let me, let me see if I can fix that, okay? You're gonna be able to fix so much more things on your own and your practice will be so much more interesting because you're constantly solving problems. So if you think of yourself as a problem solver, and then when you actually accomplish it, it's like, oh my God, that sounds better. That's actually motivating. Because then you can actually say, physically say with certainty, I am better now than I was half an hour ago. And this piece is better now than it was half an hour, even if it was that much better. Okay? And then finally, repeat. But only after all of that. 
So most, of, most, most students just repeat. They just sit down and play stuff over and over. And then you repeat the mistakes, which sadly makes the mistakes permanent. So there's a famous adage that says, practice doesn't make perfect, practice makes permanent. Whatever, if it's good or bad, doesn't matter. Makes it permanent, okay? Okay, finally, we're gonna put all this into practice and then we're gonna have a few minutes for questions, okay? So, plan ahead, plan your day, plan your week, plan your month, write it down so you can be held accountable for the things that you said you were gonna do. And then you can say, did you do it or did you not do it? Divide and conquer. There's no passage that is too hard that cannot be divided in small enough chunks and that can be played slow enough. Repeat to strengthen your retrieval strength, meaning review, right? Practice different works in one study session and review them often, every single day. Practice the hardest passages a lot more. This is what professional musicians do. Professional musicians don't have hours on end to practice, so your practice hours become very precious. So you start with the stuff that is the hardest and you work on that the longest. And then you start adding the stuff that is medium difficulty and then finally you have the stuff that is easy. Test your memory constantly. What do I mean by that? So if you want to know if you actually know a piece of music, come first thing in the morning, warm up with some scales or something that is not the piece that you're about to play and then play it and see how it goes. If it goes well, you know the piece. If it doesn't go well, it's like, okay, I still need to work on these passages. It's not after you've been working on it for two hours that goes well and then you go to your lesson the next day and it doesn't work and you're like, but, but, but it worked in the practice room yesterday. Yes, because you played it for two hours straight and then finally you got it after those two hours. The more learning styles you have, the better you'll learn. Study going backwards. I really, I really like this. So what do I mean by that? Let's say that you have a passage of eight bars. It's all fast, 16th notes, right? What most students do is they start at the beginning and they crash and burn somewhere in the middle. Right? And then they kind of like keep fudging in and then somehow they finish it, right? So instead of doing that, start at the end. Start with the last five, six, seven notes. So just do yaka da da and play it in tempo and see, did that work? Mm, it's a little uneven here. Okay, let me do it again. Yaka da da And you do it a couple of times. Okay, that's working. That sounds great. Then play the one before that. So play the last six, sixteenth notes. Yaka da da Okay, did that work? Great. Then you put play one more note before that. And you keep doing that until you get to the beginning of the passage. What are you going to accomplish by, by doing that? A couple things. First, you're playing, you're teaching your brain to start in different places all the time, which is going to guarantee you're going to learn the passage better. It's a different type of learning. So it's a different type of practice of approaching a passage. So it's going to help you learn better. Three, you're going to immediately find out where the problems are. Because if you could play the last 12 notes, and then you add a note number 13 and that didn't work, then you know there's a problem there. And then you figure out why is there a problem there? Okay, is it the fingering that I chose is not working very well? Or is it my, my motions on the keyboard are not very good? Or maybe I need a little rubato there just to make this leap work? Whatever it is, you're gonna find out where the problems are and you're gonna fix the passage a lot faster. And it's not something that you necessarily have to do every single day. Identify the problem. So if you're playing and something doesn't work, stop. And then, okay, that was not good. I'm not sure what was not good, but it was not good. Okay, so then you do it again. Okay, it's my right hand. Okay, I'm still not sure what it is. Do it again. Okay, it's right here in this bar, in this beat. Something's happening here. Let me isolate my right hand. Let me figure out what's happening. So it's like you zoom in, you fix the problem, then you zoom out and you play the passage again. Repetition is important, but it's just the last step after you really have thought about what you want to do and how you want to do it. And then finally, when you're practicing, imagine that your teacher or somebody that you admire or that you fear is in the room with you. Then ask yourself, would I be doing what I'm doing right now? Yes or no? Okay? So that's my email. If you guys want any questions, you want to follow up with anything I have said, or you have any questions, please write me an email. This is a bibliography. I'm happy to send a PDF of my presentation to Professor Gagnon, <coughs> Professor Patterson, and uh, they will send it to you guys if you're interested. Uh, otherwise, there's a series of books that are really interesting about habits, about willpower, about motivation, about learning, about memory, uh, that are very useful and they're not dry. They're actually interesting to read. So, questions? Yes? Um, so, a question. 
question would be, for example, um, Jeff, why don't you guys go back to me? I need a follow up question. Okay, that's okay. great. Anybody else? Yes. Do you ever um, do any like breathing techniques to neurologically, like like for anxiety or performance? Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay. So thank you for asking that. So you remember when I told you that when you're under stress, your prefrontal cortex gets blocked? One of the best ways to bring that thing back online is breathing. Okay, so the old grandma say of like, just breathe, it's true. It actually works. So when you're panicking, if you take a second to just like take a few deep breaths, those deep breaths are gonna actually bring that prefrontal cortex back so you can actually think rationally about what you need to do. So uh, yes, breathing is amazing. It's actually, if you're taking breaks in your practice, if you use one of those breaks to just t do some breathing exercises, that could be meditation, that could be box breathing, it could be a variety of things uh, that actually will make you much more likely to remember what you just did and prepare you for the next practice session. Now, I'm not the most disciplined person, so I don't do that every single practice break. break. I wish I could say I do, but I don't. If I do it once a day, I'll be like, yes, I did it, okay? So, but it's okay, baby steps. Also, meditation, most of us think of meditation and it's like, well, I meditate, but I start thinking of all sorts of things. I suck at meditation, I will not meditate again. No, it's okay. Like, sucking at meditation actually makes you better at meditation, okay? Even if your monkey brain is thinking of all these many things at the same time, it's okay. So, yes. Um, the other thing is, breathing exercises before performing is great. You can try a, var a variety of things you can do. Do you guys know what box breathing is? So it's like you inhale on a count of, say, four, then you hold on a count of four, you exhale on a count of four, and then you hold on a count of four, and just do that. And you can do it on a count of eight if you want. Actually, the slower the exhale, the better, because then you bring your heart rate down, which makes you less nervous and less fidgety, which is what happens to many of us when we're about to perform. You can also do visualization exercises with breathing. So like imagine yourself on stage as you're breathing and doing slow exhales and then imagine the type of sound that you want to produce imagine how you want to feel when you're on stage that's very helpful something i ask my students to do before they play um i was going to tell you one more thing i forgot about breathing it'll come back but yes breathing exercises are fantastic yes so if you set like a small term goal like while you're practicing this kind of theory i'll spend 30 minutes and get this from like four or eight to six to like 75 uh-huh Great question. Right. Okay, so thank you for asking that. So let me, I should have started with that. You guys are going to be terrible at planning. That's just how it is. Okay? Why? Because human beings, our brains are designed to be overly ambitious and overly positive, which is good because it keeps us alive, right? But that means it's like when you start to plan, when you've never done this before, and you're trying to be like, well, I think I can do that, you're probably going to be horrible at it. And you're going to way overshoot it. Okay? That's fine. So it's good that, I, that, I, that he asked that so I could tell you this. So then you don't feel disappointed. You don't feel like, oh, this is not working. I'm terrible at it. I'm not going to keep doing it. So actually planning and being horrible at it will make you be better at planning tomorrow. Because I'm like, okay, I was overly ambitious. It's not because I suck. It's because I was just too ambitious. Okay? So it's like, okay, let me scale it down and be like, okay, maybe that was too much of a, of a tempo increase because the passage is really very difficult and I'm just starting to read it. So maybe 10 clicks is a more feasible thing for half an hour. Or maybe I got too obsessed with it, so maybe it was too much. So maybe instead of that, I should have done 15 minutes on this passage here and then 15 minutes on this other passage just so I don't get overly obsessed. The other thing that is very important is you need to l learn how to listen to your body. What do I mean by that? You're playing, and it worked at quarter note equal 80, right? And it's, it felt good, and then and it sounded good, it was even, it was beautiful, it was musical, it was everything you wanted to be, right? Then you bring it to 85, and all of a sudden you start making mistakes. But your brain is like, I must keep going, I must play faster, and then you force it. That's not good, because that means that that's how far your body could go today. And I guarantee you that if you stop, and you've been doing it correctly, tomorrow you will be able to play it at 85. There's a magic that time does. Your body is slower than your mind. Your body needs more time than your mind does. And you need to learn how to listen to that and be like, that's as fast as I can go. And if you have planned ahead and you're not in panic mode, then you know you have a few days and it'll be fine by the time my lesson comes, okay? 
The other thing is, if you're in a time crunch, and this just happened to me last week, and there was a, a big shift in program because one of my trio members was not able to enter the country that I was playing at. So then all of a sudden, instead of a trio concert, I had to play a duo concert with repertoire I haven't played in 10 years or a repertoire I've never played before, and I had three days. So it's extremely stressful, okay? I try not to put myself in that situation, but it just happened. So when something like that happens, you're in crunch time for whatever reason, you took a gig because you really need the money, and you're busy, and I like, I, I will learn it because I need those $300, then what you do is you work on that passage for half an hour, take a break, work on something else, then bring that passage back again. Take a break, then bring it back again. So then you do that multiple times per day because you need to have it ready in three days. Yes? I got two. Um, you told, me, told us that system two is the opposite of system one. Mm -hmm. That it's very knowledgeable, which is used to make rational decisions and thinking is spending energy. But, um, is thinking necessarily a bad thing? Like it says, thinking spends energy. Wait, so you said, what is bad? Thinking spends energy. Yes. So Thinking is not bad. No, no, no. That's <laughs> so what do you mean? Thinking is very good. What I'm trying to say is that there's only so much thinking you can do per day. So this is also a fact. Like willpower is a limited resource that we all have that gets spent as the day goes by. As you get tired, as you get hungry, willpower starts doing this. Okay? And there's ways to refill that willpower. It's yeah. the same with thinking. So what I'm trying to think, what I'm trying to say is that thinking is expensive, therefore your brain is going to want to prevent you from thinking a lot of the time. So if you're aware that when you practice it's thinking time, that's where you should be using your thinking. Does that make sense? Yeah, and also, can you repeat what the highly attentive versus the resting state is again? Oh, highly attentive just means I'm actively learning something, so I'm actively reading this piece of music and putting fingerings and, and trying to figure out how I'm going to play it. And then resting state just means when you're not actively learning something, when you're taking a bath or taking a walk or doing something that's not related to the instrument. Resting state. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, highly attentive is actively learning and resting Yes. It is basically easy activity without instrument. Yeah. Okay, maybe one more question? Yes. What do you do on your breaks to help you be focused in it? Great question. Okay, so I'm going to give you like the ranking and then you can take your pick. So according to a lot of scientific studies, the absolute best thing you can do is meditate. Okay, as I just said, I am not nearly as disciplined to meditate in every single practice break. I don't. As I said, if I do it once a day, I count myself as the winner, okay? So, after that would be just daydreaming. Just sitting in your chair and doing nothing. Or taking a quick nap. Those are great. Then after that would be take a short walk, 10 minute walk. If you have a beautiful campus here, if you can go outside, 10 minute walk in nature will do wonders for your brain. So it's like it gives your brain a boost. After that, just go out, drink some water, go to the bathroom, talk to some people. Stretching is fantastic. 10 minute stretch, short stretch on your arms and your legs, just get up and move. After that, chatting with your friends. I, when I was in graduate school, uh, my social life was graduate school. So uh, basically what I would do is I would convince my friends to practice at the same time as me. So we just go in the practice room, do 30 minute practice sessions and then go out and talk for 10 minutes. So it was nice because then it created a social space for us and we could just chat either about the music or not about the music or complain about the music and then go back to the practice room. Uh, the other thing I used to do a lot when I was in grad school was read. I would have a book um, and I would just, when my timer went off, I would read for 10 minutes, put a timer for 10 minutes and just read for 10 minutes. And then when it went off again, I put my book away, I go back to practice. I have students that knit or do crochet or whatever craft you like, that's great. So that's, I think, and I would say maybe one out of four practice breaks and go on your phone and give yourself 10 minutes of cat videos <laughs> as, a, as a reward, you know, or whatever it is that you like to do, okay? All right, guys, I'll be around all day. I'm sorry we're, we're out of time, but I'll be around all day. So if you have other questions, just find me or send me an email. So thank you so much.